Um, hi, welcome to Collection Spotlight with the Co-Center for the Arts and First American Art Magazine. Um, if it, this is your first time joining us, this is a collaborative project that we've been working on um, for a few months now, having these amazing sessions with the Co-Center, pieces from our collection, incredible guest artists, and um, America Meredith from First American Art Magazine. So I'm here on site today at the Co Center in Santa Fe. Um, and I have our pieces pulled already to work with for our artists today. Um, I have said this before, maybe I'll say it one more time because I think there are some new people. Just the little notice that I don't wear gloves while I'm handling the pieces. That's um, intentional. That's how we work with our collection here at the Co Center. We really believe that that is the safest and most respectful way to work with our collections when permissible. So you will see me interacting with these pieces. I will bring them on screen. We have two screens here. So I'll bring them up to myself for close ups. Um, hopefully not too fast so that people can hopefully get a deeper view into the pieces themselves. So I'm going to pass it off to Rachel Wixom. Hi, I'm Rachel Wixom and uh, I am the executive director and president here at the Ralph T. Coe Center for the Arts. It's my uncle who sort of got this thing going and I moved here from New York to, to really get it going. So I want to thank all those who have been involved, particularly the artists. I also want to thank very much America and First American Art for um, really making this happen. And if you don't know who we are, the Co Center is located in Santa Fe, and we are dedicated to increasing uh, public awareness, education, and appreciation of Indigenous arts through our programs. Basically, connection and learning through Indigenous arts. That's what we're about. So I just want to mention one thing to y'all. If you have questions, please use your chat. Uh, down below in your Zoom there and uh, just type away and uh, America is going to um, take care of everything with all that. And, and now I'm going to turn it back to, I guess, America. Yeah, if I can cancel the spotlight. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I represent First American Art Magazine here in Norman, Oklahoma. We're a quarterly digital and print magazine. Print is becoming really relevant these days. And I'm so grateful and happy to welcome Liam Matafrawa. I lived in um, San Francisco for way too many years. And California not only has the largest number of Native people, it has the largest number of tribes. And yet in California, due to relocation and economic movements, um, you know, often California, Indigenous Californians feel outnumbered in their own lands by other Native people. So I'm really happy that we have Leah Mata to share an incredible uh, artistic legacy with us. So Leah, she is Northern Chumash, she, which is located on the central California coast. Um, she's based in New Mexico today, but um, she also goes back to California regularly. She's a regalia maker, a basket maker, and a jeweler who currently teaches at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And she recently came from SARA, the School for Advanced Research. So she's won numerous awards, all of which she um, definitely deserves. And take it away, Leah. Hachiu, Mikia, Leah, Mata, Frawa, and Again, I'm from the northernmost group of Chumash people, Yakitu Titu. Um, the name Chumash is actually um, an applied name by anthropologists, and it's in one of the many Chumash dialects. And it basically kind of translates to shell makers. So that's kind of what I do. Um, I do a lot of shell work, and so I'm super excited to um, look at the co-collections because they have a few pieces there. Um, one, which is the first one we'll look at, and it's an amazing, amazing piece. Um, and I'm super excited to um, talk about it and to share a little bit more about the pieces and our relationships to some of our material culture items and um, how they um, come from our bioregions. And so they're uniquely Chumash. And so I'm hoping to share a little bit about our resources, our materials, um, how climate change is affecting some of these um, materials and access to collections, um, the barriers and, and why access to collections um, are important. 
So I think, Beth, do you want to show the first um, item? Absolutely. So I'll bring it up in just... So this is a super, super cool earplug or gauge, I guess is how you would say it nowadays. <laughs> and the materials used in this, so the black that she's using is um, Pismu. Um, and it comes from the place of Pismu. And um, direct translation um, means place where the black stuff is or the dark stuff. And so that's the natural tar that comes up. And if you kind of think, hey, that name Pismu sounds familiar, um, it's, it's a location in, in um, California, um, but it's currently known as Pismo. So for those of you that have been to Pismo Beach, um, you've uh, come to my homeland area. And so this is where that tar comes from. Um, and then it's inlaid with um, our little olive shell discs or hishi beads and abalone. Um, and so all of these materials um, on this gauge um, are collected within that area, except for many of them are endangered species now, which is making um, making <laughs> jewelry or any kind of adornment um, very difficult because of the lack of access to um, our resources. Okay, so can you turn it just in the front again? And then, so those little tiny shell beads, those are olive shells. Um, it's something that um, Chumash are known for um, we are prolific shell makers. Um, we only have a handful of shell makers um, now because uh, it's one of those art forms that kind of um, was discouraged during the mission periods and, and thereafter. Um, so this little tiny olive shells, those are made from, well, they're, they're made from the olive shell and the little tiny discs we make um, we used to string them and they were, I guess what you would call in the Southwest, he she shells or he, he she strands. Um, but we also did clam strands in the same way. And you'll see in a lot of Chumash work, um, you'll see a lot of those inlaid little shell discs in a lot of our work. We put them on the rim of bowls. Um, we decorate everything with abalone and olive shell and tar. Um, and the Pismo tar is, um, not only used in our jewelry, but it's also used in um, caulking for our tamals or our ocean going canoes. Um, and so it's an important material to our community. And the abalone, um, so abalone now is on the endangered list and it, it, it's so complex with the laws and fishing and games and you know, in California, we don't have treaty rights. So our 18 treaties were um, lost. And so we don't have a lot of treaty rights helping us protect our cultural resources. Um, so it does make it difficult because um, you're kind of on your own when it comes to um, advocating and protecting um, resources or even getting access to those resources, right? Um, currently there is a statewide a moratorium or ban on abalone gathering. So it's made it increasingly difficult for tribes to access um, this particular shell. And so when we try to um, continue making our material cultural items, um, definitely um, materials and resources have a huge effect on what we make and how we're um, moving forward without having access to those materials. Um, with body adornment items in California, especially in my area, we did do a lot of piercing, body piercing and tattooing, um, which is funny because you don't see it too much anymore. Um, but we did have our chin tattoos. We did wear earplugs. We did have septum nose piercing. And so I guess um, we'd fit in well with um, younger crowds or, um, I don't know, I guess 
in Western culture, people with tattoos or septum piercings, although it's becoming more normalized, or earplugs, um, it used to be a subculture back in the day. Um, there wasn't, it wasn't as mainstream as it is now. And so um, now, you know, you see a lot more people wearing gauges and septum piercings and tattoos. Um, and when our community, um, wore these kind of um, pieces, it, you know, it wasn't taboo. It was, it was just part of how we adorned ourselves. Um, and many in our community continue to um, have their um, nose pierce or their, wear their gauges or tattoos. And so um, it's been sometimes difficult to um, have body adornment or tattoos that are considered somewhat taboo in, in American culture when it's part of your traditional culture. So um, navigating that can be kind of difficult, um, especially for um, people who want to continue those traditional practices or those, those practices and then um, kind of get looked at by mainstream society a little different or a little funny or may not be respected. Um, and so I think that that conversation is important, um, especially for communities where it's still taboo to body pierce or still taboo to have tattoos. Um, it's not like that for all, all tribes. Um, there are a lot of tribal communities um, that um, practice body adornment and it's completely um, normal. It's not, um, you know, taboo in any way. And so that's kind of hard sometimes when you go to a different tribal community where um, body piercing and tattooing can be looked at as being taboo. So, um, and one of the things that I wanted to, let's see if I have any. Um, oh shoot, I didn't bring any of the tar with me. I was hoping to have a piece, but that tar rolls up naturally on the beach and then um, we use it, we sometimes mix it with pine pitch um, to make it a little uh, softer and it just kind of helps it stick together a little more. Um, I haven't made um, gauges in a while. Um, I started making them a few years back and I had no idea about the sizes, you know, zero, double zero, all that kind of stuff. So um, it was a little challenging because I just um, couldn't tell people what size they were. Um, and, and so, Anyway, I haven't made them in a while, um, but this one is a uh, very fancy. Um, sometimes I see older collections where they're just the abalone discs. Um, so I particularly like this one because it has the um, tar and the olive shell inlay in it. So just, I want to like hold this up for reference. This is a really, <laughs> really large gauge. Like this is really big. So just to have that perspective, I think that's helpful because it's sort of hard mm -hmm. to tell when I'm holding it up and just blocking my whole face with it. Um, <laughs> it's also uh, heavier than, you know, contemporary gauges are probably. Many of them probably, are made yeah. that are oftentimes hollowed out or whatever. But it is, it's such a stunning piece for sure. So this is, it's also really hard. I mean, it feels like a ra rock. I'm not familiar with the, the tar as a material. It's ha it hardens, yeah. yeah. Um, and then if you, if I wanted to deconstruct that, I could just put it in a, a pot and, you know, melt it or reshape That's it. That's what I was it. wondering. That's yeah. so interesting. That's great. It's really for me, I have a hard time with the smell. Um, it's really toxic, so I try not to use it a lot. Um, I do use it on my um, antler and bone um, inlay when I'm doing shell work in the antlers and bones. Um, I'll use it, but it's, it's, you have to be in a well-ventilated outdoor area. Um, it's really um, strong. It's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's one of those things that I like, um, I don't know. It, I guess it's one of those things that I don't do too often, so that's why I don't make them that often, because um, the smell, it's really strong. And it'll, 
I don't know. It gives me a headache if I smell it for too long. So I try not to work with it. Or when I do work with it, I work with it really quickly. And for those of you, um, I don't know if there's any um, Chimash people tuning in, you all know how horrible that smell is. So, um, but they do make beautiful gauges and I, I'm happy when I see our younger tribal members bringing back some of those um, body adornments, whether it's tattooing or the gauges or septum piercing. Um, I'm, I'm all for it. So um, I know it's hard in contemporary society sometimes um, to get jobs um, based on body adornment. Um, again, it's becoming more normalized, but um, it still can be a barrier to employment or, um, you know, just how people in general in society treat you or look at you. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that our young people are bringing it back and that they're um, strong in, in who they are and that um, they're not intimidated by weird looks if they have um, body piercings or tattoos. So. Would these have been worn by women and men, like all genders or is it gender specific? Um, mostly school? men. Okay. Um, we also had different types of ear gauges. So um, sometimes we would use these elderberry sticks um, and elderberry, you can hollow it out. And so we put um, tobacco or medicine in them and sometimes you could wear them. Um, they're kind of like long tubes. So there's, there's different types of, and those were pr primarily worn by men. Um, so there's different types of gauges. And so sometimes those can uh, be gender specific. And is it safe to assume that these would be um, match pairs usually? Like the one in the co collection would have a, a partner somewhere? Mm hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I've seen pendants similar to this. Um, so um, they're kind of um, the abalone's pressed into the tar. And so I've seen pendants that shape as well. I don't know if they did the full matching sets, but I've seen pendants that's similar to that yeah, so. as well. That'd be stellar. There's a question that's about um, when it was made. So we have it dated at the Co as around circa 1750. Um, and presumably it was worn for sure. I mean, it has signs of age as well. And then it was where it was collected. Um, it was, uh, collected by Ted here in Santa Fe um, through a local dealer who purchased it at um, one of the ethnographic shows that happens annually in Santa Fe at the White Hawk um, ethnographic show is what it's called. Um, and it was purchased from a California collector. Beyond that, we don't have any further provenance. I wish we did, but it was there for sale on its own. So it was not ever as a pair that Ted or that the co was aware of so yeah would it have likely this might be a Leah question but would it ha likely have been um, collected by Russians uh, not in our area so okay. primarily people in our area were uh, Spanish missions and then the Mexican period and then the American period um, for me, Rush, uh, for my area, Russians didn't come down that far. Okay. Um, they're primarily more in Northern um, California or what I consider Northern California. Um, California is a huge state and depending on where you are geographically, it makes, um, makes you, I don't know, I always consider my area central, but in some maps <laughs> it's considered Southern and so I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna to go to the next piece. Yeah. Is that the basket or the uh, or the rock, the Chumash rock, the miniature Which mortar? Which would you prefer to go with, Leah? The basket oh, the, um, or the mortar and pestle? Um, let's let's stick with this with um let's do the stone bowl because that kind of still um is with body adornment. Excellent. So that's listed as a toy, but that's still quite large. Yeah. So this is pretty typical for anybody that's looked at Chumash collections um, in any archives. Um, you'll see a lot of these. Um, and, and we make 
a lot of our material culture from um, steatite or soapstone. Um, and in our homeland areas, we have like this really, really black kind of dark um, soapstone. And we have other colors, we have the greens, but um, I love the dark soapstone. Um, and we'll, let's see. So backing up a little bit, um, normally the darker black soapstone comes from the islands. Um, and also it's, it's no longer accessible to us. So um, it's one of those things where if we are going to continue to make them, we have to find um, additional soapstone in other areas that's legal. Um, so that's kind of um, a barrier for some people if they're looking to revitalize um, a lot of our stone bowls. Um, and there you go. Yeah, and I don't know if this is a toy or not. See, I haven't seen, because of COVID, I haven't even seen the collection, only through pictures. So it's really hard um, as for me to tell as well. Um, one thing about Chumash people is we loved our body paint. So um, oftentimes they were used to grind either medicines or body paints. Um, and so I don't necessarily know if it's a toy or if it's mislabeled. Um, it's hard to tell if there's any residue or anything in there, so um, through pictures. But um, if you look at any Chumash collection, you'll see tons of bowls and pestle and mortars. Um, cool. And so one of the things that, um, again, makes it difficult to continue Chumash stone work is access to um, the stones and the materials. And so, um, and, most of our free contact um, materials, again, come from our bioregion. And so these are, um, this black soapstone is unique to my homeland area. Um, and it was funny because I always had wanted to make um, some of our stone bowls or a stone, I guess anthropologists call them effigies <laughs> or stone beads. And I just wasn't sure how to approach it. Um, and then, um, I got married to a sculptor and I looked in his scrap pile and lo and behold, there was tons of black soapstone um, or Virginia steatite. And so I was able to um, make a few bowls. Um, they've already gone out to collect to private um, buyers, um, but I do have some of the black soapstone here. Um, now these haven't really been polished but these are um i don't know if people can see these these are that black um soapstone and these are tube beads these are um pre-contact beads and wow. um well pre-contact style i made these so these are contemporary beads but um the uh tube beads now these we haven't, I haven't seen anybody in my community make them in a long time. And so um, about three or four years ago, um, we were doing an all, all Chumash band event and um, one of the um, local museums happened to have um, some of these long tube stone beads and had brought them out for us to view the collections and um, uh, a Chumash, young Chumash man from another band says, oh, wow, it'd be really great if we could we make these. And um, I was like, yeah, it'd be really cool to remake them. And so when I got back home um, to Hamas, uh, I told my husband, hey, do you think you could figure out how to make these? <laughs> um, so we did, we figured it out. And so now I'm able to make these long um, tube soapstone beads. But um, and also, can I interrupt you? What are those used for? I mean, you're calling these are, beads. These are necklaces. These are for our necklaces. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. And we make them in different sizes. We have the shorter ones, but it was a really, uh, it was a real challenge trying to do the longer ones, um, right? Mm -hmm. And get those drill holes and get everything even. Um, so, so when you really have a good people tutor. Could, people could use pump drills on those uh, those olivella shell discs we saw, but with those, mm -hmm. how on earth would someone make those in pre-contact times? 
Yeah, so we used a lot of pump drill, a lot of um, sand and um, rocks sanding. Um, so, and then here's some of the green soapstone. So these are some of our, our whale effigies. And um, these, can, can uh, you look at them more? Yeah. Is it? And then what is the eye disc? That's um, shell. Okay, amazing. Yeah, inlaid, inlaid with that tar, the, the, the Pismo tar. Stinky tar. Um, yeah, the stinky tar. Um, this one's a killer whale. Um, believe it or not, I know people think of um, Central California or Chimash area being in Southern California because our area is so large. Part of it is on Central Coast and some of it is, is in what's considered Southern Coast. Um, but uh, the tar primarily, I mean, it's, it's not just in Pismo, it's, it's pretty much all in our area, but for us, um, that's where um, my particular band would go is, is to that area. Um, when I talk about Chumash bands, um, anthropologists kind of divided us by our languages because we have different Chumash languages. Um, and in California, the way we were all organized and the way that our political and social organizations um, were organized is a little different than tribes in other, other states. Um, uh, at one point, um, California was one of the most linguistically diverse places in the world. Um, and we had a huge population prior to contact of indigenous people. Um, we tend to live in smaller bands um, and we tend to um, kind of have our homeland and trade routes. Um, and so when people say Chumash, it's not one big nation, it's not one big group. Um, we actually speak different Chumash languages. Um, and within those languages, we have different dialects. So you might have an inland dialect and an, uh, a coastal dialect within like just one language group. So um, I think people tend to think of um, when you say the word Palmo or Luceno, it's just all, it's one big group. But really, um, there's so many different bands under those anthropological headings. And most of the anthropological names given to um, tribes in California are not the names that we go by. So you'll see a lot of tribes have two names or um, one is the name that they um, call themselves prior to contact. And then um, there'll be names um, that anthropologists kind of um, gave to those communities um, or kind of assigned to those communities. Um, but with the, with the stone um, and the steatite and soapstone, um, again, it's one of those resources that is becoming increasingly more difficult to um, obtain. And so, like I said, for myself with, with the soapstone steatite, um, I'm lucky that, you know, uh, my husband's a stone carver and there's lots of scraps to choose from. Um, and so I'm able to have a constant supply of this material. Um, with the abalone, um, it's a little more difficult, again, because of the moratorium. Um, and the moratorium on abalone um, tends to be from, oh, I don't even have a show with me, um, tends to be from a couple of different factors. Um, first was the over harvesting of abalone. And then secondly, um, just climate change in general. And so there's a whole chain reaction that is um, causing um, the abalone not to thrive. And so what's happening is, is right now is abalone is kind of starving to death. And so um, they're not able to reproduce or um, grow the way that they once did. And so right now, again, um, and I know I've said this before, but there is a moratorium. And yes, it freaks me out because that was a material that we use not only to sustain ourselves, um, with food, but also the shell was used um, for adornment and for other purposes. And so when we don't have access to it, um, you know, it makes it difficult to um, practice some of our um, shell making techniques or um, food, uh, um, food knowledge. And so it makes it difficult to pass that on if we don't have access to those uh, specific um, species. And so unfortunately, 
um, my main medium, which is abalone, is um, no longer um, available. And so um, there's ways to go around accessing abalone. Like you can, um, if, if abalone divers have a stash of shells that were gathered um, prior to the ban and done legally, you know, um, I could use some of those. Um, there are commercial abalone um, vendors. Um, you can buy shells from those, but those tend to be a different species than what we use in California. So um, there's, there's a lot of different species of abalone and each one comes with a different color, different size, every, and different thickness. Um, the way that you work with them is, is a little different. Um, and so in California, I prefer the red thick abalone um, rather than some of the stuff you can find online, um, which is usually power shell or a green abalone. Um, oftentimes not um, indigenous to the California coast. Um, when we so, find abalone like in thrift stores or something, is there somewhere we should mail them to? Like, sh is there an You can always contact me um, okay. yeah, via so Facebook or stuff. social media um, okay. if yeah. people want to donate. <laughs> um, yeah, because maybe you would know an artist who you don't want to use it, but maybe someone else could use it. Because I mean, <laughs> I remember them being used as ashtrays, which is so yeah, toxic and unsafe. <laughs> yeah, I you know I've seen them used as ashtrays. I've seen them used for all kinds of things, garden decorations um, and whatnot. Yeah. And there are people that have sent me shells, or um, you know, I'm re I really wish Fish and Game would work more with um, the indigenous people in California in terms of because there there is a lot of poaching. And there's yeah. not a lot of resources to go after poachers. Um, and when they do find them, um, rather than destroying the material, I really wish that there were some kind of way where um, it would work out for um, you know, tribal communities in California to have access to those. Um, but right now they just kind of destroy them. Wow. Before we move on, could we, did you, you guys saw the, um, the serpent and the yeah. lizard or maybe skink uh, imagery that. on that? Here, sorry. Yeah, so there's a flat and then the 3D. Can you speak to that, Leah? I mean, oh, and he's actually on something. Yeah, he's on the snake. Oh, so that's, yeah, it is on, so there's the snake's tail. Okay, that is 3D. It's a best relief. Yeah, yeah, it's. So we have a lot of um, lot of narratives that have serpent in them, um, and some of those are um, stories. Um, so they they we have like a snake right in the sky, which is the Milky Way. Um, we also have serpents and um, snake representation holding up the the world. So actually through um, Chumash culture, there are a lot of references to snake and um, serpents. Um, w one of um, the beliefs is that um, the snakes or the serpents are holding up this world, right? And so when we have earthquakes, it's because they're moving, because <laughs> um, they're on the lower world. Um, so there's a lot of reference. So it's not unusual to see um, snake or serpent um, representation in our material culture. Oh, cool. And then that lizard with the, the fork tongue or skink, that's really- So the lizard also is an important, um, important character in Chumash stories. And um, lizard uh, often plays um, games with coyote and, um, and serpents and snakes. So um, again, it's part of our folklore to have um, a lot of um, lizard imagery. Um, it, it, it lizards in a lot of our stories as well. Um, so again, it's just a common um, a narrative throughout um, Chumash material culture. Thanks. Love yeah. sea animals too, whales. Um, uh, stingrays, um, starfish. Uh, one thing that people don't think about when they think about um, Central Coast is 
you know, they don't think about um, the orcas or the, the, the killer whales. They don't think about um, our communities having salmon. But prior to contact and prior to all the damming and real allocation of water in California, um, we had huge salmon runs in um, Central California. Um, salmon was a huge part of, um, of our food system. And we also had um, these guys, um, the killer whales, they were also in our territories in our area. And for those of you that have traveled out to um, the islands, you, you can often see them um, if, if you happen to be um, going out there by boat. So it's, it is a part of our community. It's just that with damming and um, overfishing and climate change, a lot of those species um, are um, almost extinct in our area. Do you want to look at the basket now? You yeah, ready? let's go to the basket because okay. I love this basket. Excellent. This is a very, 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 very rare basket. It's actually not from my area. Um, this is from the Ohlone area, which is um, uh, more of the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and they were also master weavers as well. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about um, this basket is one, because I wanted just people to see a very rare basket um, and to see the shell work um, incorporated into the basket. And I am just amazed that you have one of these. It's, it's beautiful. And um, this is early 19th century? Yeah, we have it dated at circa 1825. And these are absolutely stunning baskets. Um, so the shell work, I talked a little bit about it before. Um, and I haven't seen the basket um, other than through photos and, and now, but um, so olive shell, those little discs that you saw in the earplugs, um, those were again used to decorate a lot of um, baskets. And so, and not just baskets, but we also have belts that were decorated with these olive shells. Um, I was telling America that um, uh, some of our most, I don't know, um, or some of our finest material culture was taken from our communities early on and shipped to museums overseas. Um, so in France, um, they have a huge collection of um, feather, feather dance belts um, made by Ohlone people. Um, and the olive shells um, were actually made by Chumash people. I don't know on this particular basket, but in the feather dance belts in France, um, the, uh, my people would make the um, olive shells and there would be trading between the communities. Um, and so it's very rare that you see olive shell belts or baskets. And so I just thought that people might wanna see this because when you come to California and you see the Golden Gate Bridge, um, people think about Golden Gate Bridge, Lund uh, Lombard Street, and Alcatraz. And so they don't really see the indigenous people from that area. And it's, um, I guess they're very invisible, just like most Californians, um, incredibly invisible. And so I just wanted people to be aware that there are indigenous people in the Bay Area, um, still are, always have been, and, and this is some of their fine basketry work. And this is hard too because the Ohlone do not have proper recognition and their homelands is some of the most valuable real estate in the entire world. I mean, right, if you land, so. look at tribal lands um, in California, there are no um, tribal lands anymore along the coast of California. And when you look at the most expensive real estate in the world, um, definitely the coast of California comes up in, in those searches. And um, it was purposeful. Um, and we were all kind of moved to different areas. California has a really complex system 
Um, you know, we had the mission system and then we went under Mexican rule and then we had the American rule and then we had the gold rush. So there's quite a few waves of colonization that happen. Um, and so the way that California, um, and then our treaties rights were lost um, and never ratified. And then we have the Rancheria systems. And so it's really complex, it's multi-layered. Um, and so it's, it's, there's so many nuances and um, you really have to understand California and the way California was prior to contact and what happened through all those waves of colonization and genocide and look at um, the communities and how we are organized now. Um, when, and most of the time, prime real estate in California um, is, is the coastal areas. And when you think about coastal areas, you think about how important it is to have ports, um, right? So early on, California um, lands um, on the coast were, were um, taken um, from indigenous people there. Um, most of us were brought inland or brought to missions. We never ceded our land so, so um, all of the coast of California is unceded. Um, but I, I, I really wanted to highlight San Francisco because it's such an international city and it's a huge city. And, and the Bay Area, indigenous people from the Bay Area are so invisible as well as my own community, but um, you know, just that such a huge international city has no um, representation and very little relationship with its um, indigenous people. And, you know, it, it's, it's sad. Um, it's sad that sometimes the only time people see anything from indigenous um, Californians outside of California is through collections. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think that having collections available for public access is is great so that people can look at some of these items. Um, again, that shell work is, I know very few people that do all of shell um, work anymore. And it's, it's sad that a lot of our communities um, don't have access to the cultural resources anymore. But in addition, they don't have access to um, anthropological or museum collections. And a lot of that stems from, you know, one, collections are hard to access, two, um, you know, I'd love to go see the feathered dance belts in, in France, but I just can't afford to go to France and stay for a couple of weeks and study. Um, a lot of our stuff is in Museum de, de Americo in, um, in Spain, but again, um, a lot of us just can't afford to, you know, take a month and, and go to Spain and, and look at collections. Um, I mean, even getting to DC was difficult for me and I only accessed that collection um, because of a fellowship. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have. And so um, I love it when, when museums and institutions say, well, we have public access. And it's like, well, public access for who? Um, and so it makes it difficult for our communities to, to even um, visit or see their own items from their community. And um, I know that museums are working on that. Um, I know we kind of discussed some um, ideas. Um, last time we talked, Beth and um, America. And, um, you know, I do, I think it's important that, that communities have access to their items. Um, you know, the feathered dance belts I've been trying to revitalize and I've just been going off of pictures and descriptions um, through some of my grandmother's work with J.P. Harrington and just trying to find any um, detailed instructions of how they were made, what materials and, you know, so I spend a lot of time on trial and error when it would be really <laughs> more efficient if I could just look at the item. Yeah. Um, and and so you know i i'm super happy to find that the co had these um and i'm close to the co or close enough so maybe after covid i could take a closer look um and i would like to know like my loney friends to know that there's also a basket here um and you know hopefully maybe some of them can come out and and look at the basket um and again when I talk about, you know, yes, museums are, are doing public access, but it's 
there's still a lot of barriers with um, community coming to look at those items and do research. So I don't know to any museum personnel out there. Um, <laughs> there's a few. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hint, hint, more grants. Um, I don't know. There's there's ideas um, that I think um, we could kind of help um, travel communities have access to their items, um, and or maybe even repatriate them at some point. Um, and I know that's a sticky word. If there's um, a good place for the tribe. Right. And it, it gets <laughs> complex. It's not that easy as just repatriating. So I don't want to. Especially wanna... perishable items. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, but anyway, I don't know if there's, um, do you guys do a question or answer well, format? We, or We haven't really looked at that basket much. You are an actual basket maker. Could we yeah. look at the base and could you explain like the construction perhaps? Sure. So this is a coiled basket. Um, now in California and in other where, well, I, I don't want to talk for all Californians, but um, so in California, um, again, I've talked about this throughout the, the um, Zoom presentation today. Uh, your bioregion really shapes what your material culture looks like because you are using items that come from your area. And so different bioregions use different materials because different items grow in those um, areas. So in my particular area, we use sedge um, in, well, in Northern Chumash tend to use sedge and deer grass. Um, further south, um, it's juncus on juncus. Sometimes we use juncus and sedge on deer grass or juncus and sedge on a sedge, or not on a juncus foundation. I'm getting all my terms mixed up, but, um, but in, in Ohlone area, from what I understand, they are, are sedge weavers. Um, and so that is a uh, plant that also grows in my area, but um, not too much further past northern Chumash area. So that's why you'll see um, some Chumash weavers use different materials because again, Chumash area is huge. Um, it's all the way from um, uh, Paso Robles in, inland all the way down to Crusoe Plains and then down um, south down into Ventura. So it's, it's a huge area and along the coast. So um, again, and that's not a Chumash nation. Those are just kind of the general Chumash area, but within those boundaries, there are multiple tribal groups and layers of, and bands. Um, and same with Ohlone people. That's kind of just a broad term, but there are different Ohlone bands. They um, tend to occupy um, bioregions that are diverse as well. With a coil basket like this, um, each Sorry tribe. To interrupt you. Um, this is described as red bud. Is that the same kind of red bud that we would have here in Oklahoma? I was just going to ask that, America. <laughs> oh, thanks. I don't know. I haven't seen your red bud in Oklahoma. It's got purple flowers, and it's good to eat. So, um, I don't. I'm not a red bud weaver where I'm from. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, so. On this particular basket with the um, coil, so if you want to just kind of flip the bottom, yeah, either way, front or back, yeah. So um, with coil baskets, um, sometimes you can tell um, unique details about the weaving community by the materials, again, being place-based, but also by how they make their baskets start. Um, so that little tiny very first middle part um, of the spiral, that's considered what we call a start. And so a basket start, um, some kind can go clockwise, it can go counterclockwise. Um, there's different ways communities start their um, starts. So some can have a knot, some can have like a, I don't know, I call it like a clock wind up. Um, but all of those features are unique to different communities. And so that's kind of what makes a basket represent that community, right? So the way that they weave, the direction, the materials, how they do their starts, um, all of those are, um, are unique to that community. Um, and so like for my community, we do a knot start and we weave clockwise um, or we tend to weave clockwise. So. Um, Sorry to interrupt you again. When you talk uh, about weaving clockwise, are you talking from the top or the bottom? How so, you um, 
Yeah. So there's a work face. And so a work face is your working side of the basket for, for this particular basket. You're working on the inside. Um, okay. is your work work. So that's why it doesn't look as pristine or as smooth or as, um, as the outside of the basket. Um, so when your work face is facing you and you were weaving clockwise, that would be uh, or weaving to the right. All right. That would be a clockwise, um, yes. weave. Does that answer your question? Is it? Yes. So yes, it's it, the work face is a face that's facing you and it's usually the rougher kind of space where you um, are working from, I guess. Does that explain it? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, this basket's just amazing. And I, I, I absolutely love the shell work. I just love all of shell, he, she, beads. Um, and uh, I don't know if you're willing to take questions now that you were turned to before, but um, I can let everyone unmute themselves if you want to ask directly. Yeah, I'd be happy to take a few questions. Cool. Don't be shy, people. <laughs> It'll just make it awkward. <laughs> More awkward. You can also yeah. type your questions if you don't want to. Yeah. What are you working on right now? What art projects? Well, um, it's funny because, and I keep saying this in all my Zooms, but I can't drive the point home hard enough. Climate change is, is real. <laughs> it has completely made me change my medium. Yeah. And I say that because it's, you know, I'm on the forefront because I'm in the ocean. I'm, I'm actively seeing it change, right? So, but when you're buying your resources, you're buying your coral or you're buying other shell, you're not seeing the impact maybe other than prices and boy, it's getting harder to find quality pieces. Eventually, you know, coral users, um, I mean, even turquoise, right? Some stones, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to lose access to those at some point. And so, how do um, artists pivot? And are collectors going to accept um, our pivot, right? Because I don't need an anthropologist telling me, well, that's not traditional too mash. They didn't use that <laughs> kind of material. You're right, we didn't because we didn't have climate change and I didn't have to worry about it. Um, so I hope that collectors and um, art critics um, <laughs> understand that artists will have to pivot and we may have to exchange materials and that doesn't make a ring or a necklace or anything less valuable. Um, it just means that we're, we're switching and we're, we're sustaining ourselves, right? Cause that's what we indigenous people do best, right? We sustain ourselves. I mean, no matter what's been thrown at us, we're still here and um, we're still creating uh, material culture or art, however people want to label it. Um, I'm horrible with labels. Um, and so when we have to replace those materials, I really, again, hope that collectors and, and um, art critics are supportive of that transition. And there may be people coming um, with um, ideas um, that might not be receptive well. And I just ask collectors and art critics to be patient because we're having to transition and work with new mediums. Um, we may have to replace a material um, item and it, we may not get it right the first time. And so just to you know, support artists as we pivot. Um, for mm -hmm. myself as a regalia maker, my favorite thing to make our, our dance dresses, that's what I started making. Um, <coughs> but my time is, um, uh, hold on. Sorry, got a call at the same time. I hope <laughs> that right. didn't, okay. No. Well, I was worried I'd disconnect. Um, <laughs> I tell my kids, don't call me during these times. But they don't, I don't think they, I think they're on California time, so they didn't listen. But, um, so for myself, you know, I've really had to pivot hard because my main medium plus other mediums I work with are just not available. So, so um, you use Truly Read. What are some other mediums or mediums? Um, Truly, Truly Read, I can still find, although when it's drought time, it's, it becomes difficult. Um, 
I, we use Thule, again, for a lot of things. We use them for our non-ocean going vessels, so more streams and, and river type of boats. Um, Thule was used as mats. We used them to wrap um, things in. We use them for our baby basket. So it's a material that we use quite a bit. Um, we still have access to it, but I noticed with drought um, and some of our marsh areas drying up or water being diverted that it, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find good pieces. Yeah. Um, and are you working with woods or other textiles? Yeah, willow, a lot of willow. Um, elderberry is another wood that we use quite a bit. Um, and we use the flower, the berry, pretty much the whole tree. Um, but, uh, and I haven't, because of COVID, I haven't been out this season. Um, so I normally have gathering, well, our, our materials are collected seasonally. So, um, but I haven't been able to go out since January. Um, and I doubt I will be, so I'll be missing a whole season of gathering and collecting. Oh, um, yeah, I know COVID is crazy. Um, so it's restricted my ability to go back home and gather, um, which then also kind of changed the direction I was going in artistically. Um, so uh, my transition um, so that I can continue to make dresses is I'm doing dolls. So I'm just doing regalia smaller scale. Um, the one thing I like um, with transitioning is it's definitely um, pushing the boundaries of my skills and, and um, having me learn new skill sets um, with uh, making dolls. And it's been challenging, but, um, you know, it's probably a good time because I can't go anywhere. So, um, you know, it's forcing me to kind of get down and, and, and push through learning a new medium. Um, and, you know, like I said, be patient with artists um, for those of us that we'll have to use different materials or switch mediums because of climate change. Um, uh, it's, it's a challenge. It really is. And it's scary because that's how I make my living. Yeah. Um, and it's not only, yeah. And I'm worried for my kids. You know, I wanted to teach them how to eat abalone. I want to teach them how to gather. I want to teach them all those things, but I, how do you transmit, um, traditional knowledge when you don't have access to those items anymore. Um, and so I feel like art is also in that kind of, or at least for place-based artists, um, we're kind of in that predicament, um, you know, having to think about how do we pivot? What do we do? Um, not only for art, but just so that we can sustain traditional knowledge for our younger generations. I mean, is there a point where we're just going to tell them stories and show them pictures and they'll never know. Are you able to harvest willow in New Mexico? Are you yeah, able they to have a, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and actually, um, it, and this is for all basket weavers, um, you'll appreciate the story. So Cliff and I have to drive from Hamas to California a billion times a year. It seems like a billion, it almost seems like a regular commute. Um, and so uh, we were driving and we were getting towards um, Gallup and I'm like, pull over. And he's like, what? And I'm like, I saw Thule. And he's like, no, not the <laughs> desert. And I'm like, no, I swear I saw Thule. I swear I saw it. And so he's like, on the way back from California, we'll remember this exit and we'll stop. So we get close to, we return from California and um, we're getting close to the exit and he pulls off. And, you know, I'm like, it's over there, it's over there, you know, and he's driving, driving, and we get to this marsh, and sure enough, there's Thule. How did it get um, there? <laughs> it's just something that your mind looks for, like, as a basket weaver, you're, especially in California, because so much of our land has been privatized, or um, for ranching, and it's been put into, pri or to parks, um, a lot of our traditional homeland is, is, um, illegal for us to gather on. So um, a couple of my friends and I, we use the term um, guerrilla gathering, um, but really, yeah, you risk um, fines or um, going on private property just to get enough materials to make a baby basket or to make a basket or to, you know, whatever you need. 
Um, but I was lucky to find a spot in New Mexico. So I do have a Thule <laughs> source. Um, it's a little different species, but it works. Um, and it's great for um, the species that they have in um, New Mexico. I love making cordage out of it. It's really a good, um, a good fiber. So um, I tend to like it a little bit better for cordage than, than what I have in California. So, so. <laughs> that worked out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who spent an hour with us. Um, all the all the videos are able, you can find them on Coast Center for Art. So I just put that in and we'll meet again in two weeks, which will be August. Oh my God. Like it's not fun. The time sure is flying. August 4th, Tuesday. And it's always the same time, even though I read it differently every week, I screw it up. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much, Leah. Well, thank you everybody. And, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks America and the Coast Center um, for hosting me and allowing me to share a little bit about um, Indigenous people in California. And um, again, thanks everybody who tuned in. And I should say, if you don't know, um, CEBA, the California Indian Basket Weavers Association, is an awesome resource for Indigenous California um, art knowledge.